Hello, my friends. Welcome to another episode of Retro Ups and Downs. And don't start all that. It's not retro only because it was a few years ago. Retro, in this sense, just means it's a little bit older than today. Besides, we've got our dressing gown on. We're comfortable. Let's see what was happening in the world of wrestling back in 2018. So it does mean we have to approach these kind of differently because we are focusing on NXT. So when we look at the wider sports entertainment world, we have to talk about WWE. AEW didn't exist. Because, of course, TakeOver New Orleans happened the night before WrestleMania 34, which means everyone was just going, oh, we have to watch Brock Lesnar versus Roman Reigns again. And, of course, this was the evening when Roman Reigns lost, even though he should have won. And do you know when the big dog found out about this? On the day in question. Which is why he felt bad about inviting all his family members, because he was like, oh, hi, I'm going to win the world title. And then he didn't. So basically, WWE was trying to have their cake and eat it too, because they knew that everybody in New Orleans were going to be going, boo, boo, we hate you, Roman. And they weren't saying boo words. And there was also a bunch of other rumors that Brock was about to go back to the UFC. This was totally mad. There's a good chance he was actually pissed off as well, because, of course, this is also the evening when he walked backstage after winning or retaining the Universal Championship, and he hurled it at Vince McMahon. Now, look, this is pro wrestling, so it could have been a work. When you do watch it, it's in many a documentary, he does lob that thing pretty hard. And if they had pre-planned this, nobody told Shane McMahon. Because do you know what Shano did? He ran after Brockus Lesnar. Now, Brock never knew about this because he got in a car and went, Meh, and he drove away. But what was Shane going to do? Beat up Brock Lesnar? Yeah, right. WWE was also getting ready for the greatest Raw Rumble ever that was going to happen in Saudi Arabia. The only reason I throw that in there is because when I did read this, I was like, oh my gosh. When I watched that pay-per-view premium live event, it was 24 hours before I made my own wrestling debut. So I'll just put that to one side. I don't want to be an arrogant Allen. It made me smile. Screw all that, though, because we are talking about NXT. And honestly, if you look at all the shows over that weekend, TakeOver Orleans absolutely stole the show, mostly because Triple H was like, hey, boys and girls, you can basically do whatever you want. And it pissed the main roster off somewhat fierce because they were like, well, we can't compete with that. we got to listen to Vinnie Mac. There are also over 12,000 people in the Smoothie King Arena, which is the best name for a venue in the history of the world. And that's a hell of a lot of people... And yeah, if you've never watched this thing and you're into some good old-fashioned heart in wrestling, well, you need to go and change that now. And as we have put on the title too, this is widely considered the best takeover in the history of mankind. So let's take the retro finger of power and up those downs for TakeOver New Orleans. So the first thing you do see on this pay-per-view is a live performance by Kane Hill. Now, I like this band because I'm super-duper into heavy metal, but I'm also going to let you into a surprise. I can't explain why this is the case, but I don't really like live music performances at any wrestling events. I know, even when Motorhead played Triple H's entrance theme, and man, do I love Motorhead, I was like, man, I just think I want to get on with the wrestling. So more fool me, somebody throw me in the toilet. You soon do realise why this NXT TakeOver gets so much praise, though, because the very first match is a ladder match, and it's the crown, the first ever North American champion. It's also Adam Cole versus Ricochet versus EC3 versus Killian Dane versus the Velveteen Dream and versus Lars Sullivan. Let's just say when it gets to those latter two, well, we all know the deal, but we do have to talk about history, but yes. Not very good. Instead, let us focus on the fact that we did have a brand new champions here. Because these six guys tried to kill each other, it took about eight minutes before we as fans went, well, man, I better care about this North American belt, because if they're willing to sacrifice their life, at the very least, I can put some importance on it. Also, as Killian Dane or Big Damo is in this, I just want to put my two thumbs in the air. Because that dude is a super, super stellar human being. And he deserves all the praise he can get. The crowd is also crazy for this, as you'd expect, because there are so many of them, and it's a ladder match. And quite clearly, we are shining a spotlight on Ricochet here. And this made me feel warm and fuzzy in my tum-tum, because zoom forward to 2023, and finally, finally, we are doing the same thing on the main roster. Like, I know he lost to Logan Paul, but for the last few months, he has been like a star in the sky. That's absolutely where he should be. I'm looking at him now. He also just does a springboard shooting star press to start this, because of course he does, when Adam Cole must have been some kind of future seer, because he just starts going dive, 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 obviously knowing that in 2023, dives were going to sponsor professional wrestling. Lars Sullivan has quite the idea, because he looks in a ladder, and instead of going, maybe I should climb that and get the belt, he puts it around his neck and basically uses it as a weapon. 
That's the thing, out of context, it's really weird. The whole pack then realises, oh, wait, this guy is massive, so they all come together to power bomb him. And honestly, somehow it looks super duper devastating, I don't even know why. When Dane gets fed up of not being involved, so he grabs Ricochet and just throws him into a ladder. And this was so damn hard, I was ringing the kayfabe police going, man, I think they've forgotten what wrestling is. Adam then goes mad with kicks that are super, including one on Rick, who he takes out in midair. Because again, Ricochet was intent on killing himself. When he was like, oh my gosh, I forgot about the point of the match. I gotta get this championship. And that's when EC3 has his moment and he just hurls him back down to the floor before. This is what I was doing the whole time. <laughs> but it was a defense mechanism because I was terrified. They then get big men slapping man meat because Lars catches Killian and he throws his ass down too. And that's ridiculous. When Ricochet climbs the ladder, somebody goes to push him off. And as he's falling, rather than just take a bump, he turns that into some kind of tope and into some kind of dive. And he takes out everybody on the outside. And I remember seeing this back in the day I was like, I don't ever think I've seen that before. And that may be true now too. There's also then a DVD into a ladder bridge as I started to go a week at the knees and oogly boogly. And then EC3, Sullivan and the Dream basically do the same thing. And you get Velveteen going to the top rope and hitting his elbow drop. And honestly, I'm not exaggerating what I'm doing right now with my neck. That's how tall this damn ladder is. Ricochet just will not let this lie. So he finally takes out Lars Sullivan, who's basically the final boss. And this is when Adam Cole says, uh-uh, Rick, you ain't climbing the ladder. He tips him off. He realizes that his pathway is clear. He goes up rung by damn rung. And he grabs that North American championship. And really, when you do look at the field, he had to win. Triple H was ready to push him to the moon, which is what we should have done on the main roster. Instead, somebody wanted to make him a manager. Wonders never cease. Many people still call this the best multiple person ladder match of all time. And once again, even watching it today on a random midday in August, I still think there's a good argument for it. I mean, it's just go, 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 move, move, move. Death, death, death gets a round of applause. And it doesn't just get an up, it gets a gold. I think too, if you want some kind of a headline, it's just the balance between big guys and flippy dippy doodah guys. That is the recipe for success. Let me feast on your bones. What? This is when poor Shayna Baszler and Ember Moon had to follow this. And honestly, you could have sent the Rock and Hulk Hogan out there and they still would have struggled. But fair play to these two guys because they did everything they needed to do and it's got a damn good finish. Ember Moon was the champion at the time, although she was earmarked for the main roster because she was going to go, <laughs> surprise, on the Raw after WrestleMania. But even without that, if we hadn't have coronated Shayna here, it would have been crazy. She had risen to the top by this point and she just came across like a right killer. We also tried to make this feel like mania because Hellstorm does play Ember to the ring. I've already talked about that. I won't talk about it again. And you have Jessamine Duke and Ronda Rousey in the crowd going, oh, Shayna Baszler, we love you. And given what just happened at SummerSlam, well, that feels very timely. I think they both knew that they were gonna have to bring their A game here too because they get in the ring and they just started kicking the crap out of each other. It meant I had to ring the kayfabe police again and they hung up on me. They were like, why do you keep calling this? There's no such thing as the kayfabe police. The thing is though, Baszler's first shot is basically a knockout blow. And when Ember does get back to her feet, she starts stomping on Shayna's hand, which she shouldn't have done. Cause you know, that's Baszler's move. And nine times out of 10, when you steal somebody else's maneuver, they get really, really mad. Baszler then comes back with a V trigger for a near fall. And no matter what kind of report you read from the time, everyone's like, oh man, she must have been watching Kenny Omega matches. Can you believe it? And I was like, how is this a bad thing? This is like the people that go, oh my gosh, LA Knight's just the rock. Oh no, you kind of feel like one of the best wrestlers ever. What an absolute goober. It is actually really important to watch all of this too, because it reminds you how we should be treating Shayna Baszler on Raw or SmackDown. At one point, she gets thrown into Rita the ring post and she acts like her shoulder has been separated. So she goes back to Rita and she starts whamming this thing into it to try and click it back into place. Now look, nine times out of 10, if somebody did this, you'd be like, man, this is really stupid. But because she just has these facial expressions that make you go, <laughs> please don't beat me up. You totally buy it and you totally buy her. Ember then decides, well, if you're going to do that, I shall hit you with the eclipse 
to the outside. I mean, that is absolutely insane. And by this point, I think Basil was a little bit worried. So she's trying to apply the Kira Fuda clutch, but of course she can't because now she's only got one limb. Once again, though, we just go back to the question, well, how do we make Shayna Baszler a warrior? Because eventually she does lock this in again. And when Ember starts whacking at this injury, she goes, all right, fine. What I'm going to do is I'll do it with one arm and I'm going to hold onto my own hair, something I can't sympathize with, to apply the force that usually I would get by using the other arm. So I was just giving this a round of applause. I'm like, this is flubbing great. Once again, I'm plugging in. Now this does go on for a long ass time and really we probably could have shortened it by a good 30 seconds or so, but it doesn't matter. Eventually Ember Moon does have to tap out, otherwise she is gonna die because she can't breathe and again, she was about to go to the main roster where WWE did not have a clue what to do with her, whereas Shayna was going to rule the women's division. I enjoyed this muchly, especially because they had to overcome that first match, which is Looney giving it up. When we just turned Adam Cole into some sort of superhero. Because it is the final of the Dusty Rhodes Classic, meaning it was Roderick Strong and Pete Dunne taking on the authors of Pain. But because the Undisputed Era had just gone, ha ha, we're going to interfere in the final, William Regal had gone, well... That was just dumb, wasn't it? Now I'm gonna make a three-way. I mean, do you not watch wrestling? You should have seen it coming. Of course though, this did mean that it was Adam Cole and Kyle O'Reilly. So Cole comes out like, oh my God, I can't believe I have to have another fight after that ladder match. But honestly, not only is this such a good three-way tag match, but the finish, chef's kiss. I shouldn't have done it. Jeff Jarrett and Dustin Rhodes are at ringside. So once again, this is very much a pre-AEW show. And the first two people we get are Pete Dunne and Kyle O'Reilly. Now, I'm sure they did have a singles feud back in the day, but I've forgotten it. But I watched the whole thing going, man, we need a singles feud. The Authors of Pain are still being treated like absolute monsters here. And they actually hit the last chapter pretty early on. And they have the one, two, three. This is when, obviously, being the goof I am, I started to laugh because I was like, of course their finisher was called The Last Chapter. I'd forgotten, if you're called The Authors of Pain, everything needs to be named after a book. Strong then breaks this up at 1-2-R, where Dunn starts doing the finger break spot on Razor. That's like, you can't do that, Peter. How's he going to read? The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle secondary character then gets Olympic slammed by Kyle O'Reilly, which, to be fair, is quite the sight. When Pete Dunn is packed, just doing Pete Dunne things. Imagine in 2018, I told you, don't worry. He is going to get called up and he's going to be called Butch. You'd be like, I don't know what you just said. Though actually, as a quick aside, I think Mr. Dunne has done tremendous with Butch. He totally gets it. He knows how to stay employed. It also looks like he's about to have the damn thing one, and you know the deal if you did watch this show. This is when Roderick Strong decides, well, I know we've been fighting for a good 15 minutes here, but screw you, Pete Dunne. I'm actually not your friend. I have actually hanged my coattails with the Undisputed Era. He absolutely whips his ass. He hits him with the heartache, which actually is quite fitting, all things considered. He gets O'Reilly. He puts him in top. The Undisputed Era retain their tag team champions. When all these four guys come together, Bobby Fish swims out here too, even though he was injured. And really, this is when we were about to turn the whole show into the Undisputed Era show. And was that a mistake? No. No, it wasn't. It was flabby great. Well, I really did love this even second time around, and that was me knowing that the big swerve was coming. And it's just Roderick's face at the end of this. He's so pleased. And I know, it's proper wrestling silliness. Why the hell would you wait this long? But I don't care. That's where the magic is. That's where the emotion is. That's where the reaction is. It is getting it up. It hasn't aged today. When we do finally get a title changing hands, this is crazy. Because it is Alistair Black versus Andrade with Zelina Vega in Andrade's corner, which actually ties into AEW Collision. And also don't forget that Zelina is the real wife of Tommy End, who is Alistair Black, now Malachi Black. So my word, here we were just crossing the stream. First thing Black does too is a springboard moonsault. And I was like, <laughs> this is why the main roster guys are so mad. You'd never get that in WWE at the time. And because Zelina is out with Mr. Tranquillo, she just doesn't care, man. She's like, look, Mr. Referee, you can't do nothing with me. And she hits a Hurricane Rana onto Black and he goes into Simba the Steel Steps. I was like, man, when they're having dinner later, he's going to be pissed. They really are trying to kill Alistair here too because Andrade then takes his head and throws it into Rita the ring post. And look now, we have seen these guys get the momentum back in 2023 but when you go back a few years to this pff, man wwe did not use them in the right way 
They are so damn over, and they have such a damn good match. And Friday then goes springboard crazy, but like all wrestlers, he just won too many, so Black just smacks him out of midair. And because this distracts the referee a little bit, I suppose because he's like, wow, you guys are really good at this. Selena Vega is just getting involved again. When I mean, she is back with another Hurricane Rana, and somewhere in the interim, I think Alistair Black went, and he drunk his Phoenix down, because he gets back to his feet, he hits the Black Mass, and he has this thing what? And just as the ref is about to count three, Selena grabs Andrade's foot and she put it on the ropes. I mean, the timing is superb and this crowd is mad. So I do get it, it is constant shenanigans, but sometimes it does work, especially because Andrade then hits the big stomp and he hits the double knees, but Malachi Black, excuse me, Alistair Black, kicks out at two. So once again, we were treating this like NXT's WrestleMania, that's essentially what it was. It gets even better because Black then goes for the second Black Mass and somehow Andrade dodges this like he's in the Mentrix and he drop kicks him right in the back. It was so well done, it's so smooth. They are then just reversing everything because again, they are so good. When Zelina's like, man, I can't handle this anymore. And she takes it way too far. She just climbs up the top rope. She goes to give a cross body to Alistair Black. The referee once again is just going, <laughs> is that this a bunch of fun? But this time, Alistair moves. She goes into the arms of Andrade. Andrade, which is when Alistair hits the black mass, Zelina falls on the floor, Andrade is dead, one, two, three, and it does mean that Alistair Black is the NXT men's champion, and again, go and listen to the response, this was absolutely perfect. So it really is just another banger, and this whole show is absolutely stupid, so I am going to give it an up. We ain't even done. Because Triple H had decided to book this show like it was 1982, and because our main event was an unsanctioned match, that's why it had to go on last. Because again, as I'm in sanction. It's also Tommaso Ciampa versus Johnny Gargano, and you could probably argue this is the peak of their feud, especially because you have the added emotion that if Gargano doesn't lose, he's not going to be allowed back into the company. Now, I don't think anybody in their tootsie toes totally believe that, but were you 100% sure? No. I mean, they are just flying into an over Barry Barricade instantly to get this heat, and Tommaso Ciampa is so damn hated. And at one point, he has stood on a table and he suplexes Gargano into the floor. I just looked at this like, what are you doing? You're pro wrestlers, it's meant to be the other way around. They then go through tables anyway as Johnny power bombs Tommaso into the exposed concrete. This is like the first three minutes. And look, you remember black and gold NXT matches, this goes long. It really does work though, because again, Champa is so despised by this audience, they start to chant, you deserved it, which is essentially a bunch of people saying that he deserved to be killed. Not sure what that says about them, let's just move on. Ciampa then sees somebody in the crowd with a crutch, so he just grabs it from him. So look, this makes him a double asshole, because one, that thing's gonna hurt, and two, how is this individual gonna get home? Now he can't walk. It turns out he made a terrible decision, because Gargano gets this, and he just starts to wail on the man. But then once again, Johnny Boy goes for his spear through the ropes, and Ciampa knees him right in the skull. And if you came in here right now and said, Simon, you know Johnny Gargano broke his head on that move, I'd be like, yes, what else was going to happen? John still comes back with a Gargano escape just so we could sell the idea that rope breaks do not matter because there's no rules in this, which is when Ciampa got a gun and went and shot Johnny Gargano. I mean, he didn't do that, but why? didn't he do that. If there's no rules, somebody get a gun. As soon as Tommaso is in trouble properly, he just whams Johnny Gargano right in the balls because he is the biggest assholes in the planet. And this is when we get into the near falls. And honestly, I can't do it justice. It is so, so good. See, the turnbuckle also soon gets exposed, which sounds terrible now I've said it. This is when Gargano takes Champa and he lawn darts the man into the metal buckle. Like this was Kevin Nash and Rey Mysterio in WCW. You can tell that these two guys have been told, look, you can go out there and do whatever you want. And they took it literally. We even ensure to underline the fact that Gargano is a super baby face because towards the end, Tommaso is like, no, no. He starts begging off and Johnny actually takes sympathy on it. Now he did look like kind of an idiot because Champa then gets the crutch and smacks him around. But you know the deal. It's all gonna be okay. Because Triple H understands that Gargano does need to look strong, so he basically takes the knee brace off Champa and smashes it right into his head. And then when he goes back to the Gargano escape, he gets this knee brace, goes through, smashes it into his face to the point Champa's like, well, I can't grab the ropes. I also have a foreign object being crushed into my nose. There's nothing else I can do. And he taps out and once again, 12,000 people go absolutely nuts. This is also sold like, oh my gosh, he's gonna die if he doesn't do this. So everybody walked away and saved face. And also, as we have got to the end, Mauro Ranallo on commentary, dude, 
we got to bring him back. That guy is next level. Now we do know over the next couple of years, maybe this was going to go a little bit too far, but I don't care about that. I care about what happened on this evening. And it's rare we do this, but sometimes you have to call a spade a spade. It doesn't just get an up, it gets a golden up. I mean, you also get everything at the end with Johnny Gargano and Candice LeRae being like, oh, we're back in NXT. This really is a phenomenal pay-per-view. I totally understand why people say it's the best ever. Now, please do leave a comment below and let me know what other matches, what other shows we do when it comes to retro ups and downs. And yes, retro can be any point towards 2023. it will be dead one day. I'm not going to worry about definitions. And look on the screen right now. There is an ups and downs that will be a retro version. Click it and continue the journey. My name is Simon for What Culture. Thank you very much for joining me as always. Again, retro ups and downs is bi-weekly or fortnightly. So I'll see you in two weeks. You take care of yourself. I love you. Goodbye.